welcome our next uh, panelist up here, Dr. Bird, who I've had the pleasure of spending some time with last year as well. As we welcome him, you know, one, one of the sort of more mysterious questions that comes up with regard to our own immune system, it's designed to battle infection, it's designed to battle injury, uh, but sometimes the body starts to turn on itself, and that is the nature of autoimmune diseases, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, lupus. Uh, so here to describe what the pharmacy of the future might look like with regard to autoimmune diseases, please welcome Dr. Burt. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is where it all began for me, back when I was a fellow at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And I'm in a lab there with my wife. And that's where I had the original idea of using stem cells for autoimmune diseases. And what I want to clarify, particularly for multiple sclerosis, which is a neurologic autoimmune disease, is these stem cells, the concept is not to induce remyelination or exonal regeneration. The concept is to reintroduce immune tolerance, because these are immune stem cells that we get from the peripheral blood, just out of a vein in your arm or neck. And so these are immune stem cells that we use to regenerate tolerance and then see how the patient does afterwards. Um, I think it's important to realize that when we did this, we actually followed the path that major pharmaceutical companies follow from a concept first reported that this, we, this could possibly work in 1995 to preclinical animal models, and here's some of our publications. We have more publications than this in MS, and these are specific to multiple sclerosis. But then after the preclinical animal models, we went on to clinical trials. And those clinical trials are phase one, phase two, phase three. That is phase one safety, phase two efficacy. And phase three is to show how it works against a, a drug therapy out there in comparison. And we just completed the phase three trial. I had the privilege of presenting those results in Lisbon last month at the American Academy of Neurology in Los Angeles yesterday. Uh, and so I can show you what I've already presented, but there's information we have that I can't present yet because it's proprietary for the publication that this will be coming out on. What I want you to realize, though, is we did this with no pharmaceutical support whatsoever. We just did it from sheer willpower. And uh, so I quickly to show you, to bring us why the, uh, we designed the phase three trial, the randomized trial the way we did, I want to show you our last data on uh, the non-randomized trial. That is the phase two data on efficacy. And these are three trials of stem cell transplant for multiple sclerosis for relapsing remitting MS done at three different centers. My center in Chicago, that's my name, Bert, 2015, and 115 patients that we reported in the Journal of American Medical Association about two years ago. And those, then I show you the results of two smaller trials, one at the University of Uppsala outside of Stockholm, Sweden, and the other by Fred Hutch called the HALT trial with 25 patients. And what I'm showing there is, is called NEDA, no evidence of disease activity. That means after this treatment, the patients have no clinical relapses, no progression of neurologic disability and no new or enlarging lesions on MRI. And those are the results. And surprisingly, these three different trials done three different places come out with very similar results for disease-free survival, if you were, if you'll call it that. It's called NEDA, no evidence disease activity. How does that compare to drugs? Well, here are the drugs. And you can see there's a major difference. Now, one of the things about drug companies is they generally report the results at one to two years and not longer. We don't have data what happens. You get on a drug, you stay on it, but what happens after one or two years it hasn't really been generally reported. And, but you can see there's a marked difference between the stem cell trials in terms of disease-free survival or NADA versus the drugs. It's you know the best drugs there, natalizumab, also called Tysabri, ocrelizumab, alentuzumab. Those are the newest, quote, best drugs. You're getting uh, 40 to 50% at one year, uh, maybe two years, versus double 
that with a stem cell transplant, plus you stay on those drugs. If you look at the green line under drugs, that's the CLIMB cohort from Harvard. And what they've reported is how this group of 216 MS patients have done over time with their best available drug therapies that they could mix or match, just giving the best care. And if you look out to about four years there at that green dot, you see it's 18% disease-free, no new activity of the disease on the best drugs, where if you look under four years for the three drug trials at the top, you see it's 70%. So there's quite a difference. And why that's important is that that allowed our statisticians, working with statisticians, to predict the number of patients we need for a trial. So for most trials, you have to have 200, 250 patients in each arm. And the reason for that is a concept called equipoise. That is, the two treatments are fairly equal in outcome, so you have to do a large number of patients to show a difference. That equipoise is an important concept because ethically you don't want to give a really superior treatment to one group of patients and an inferior treatment to another, yet our data suggests that's the case. But we could do it in a, because it's such a difference in the equipoise of the efficacy if this data is correct. If there wasn't something weird about the patients selected for transplant compared to drug therapy, we could do a smaller number of patients. But to also keep equipoise, if they failed on the drug therapy, they could cross over to transplant. Now, I'll show you, we did the trial. It was international in uh, several different countries, in Chicago, in Sweden, in Great Britain, University of Sheffield, and in Brazil. We called it the MIST trial. Everybody's at least now 18 months. We have 3.5 years mean follow-up, uh, three years median follow-up, so longer follow-up than the drug company trials that have been reported. And uh, in terms of, of the design of the trial, our statisticians felt we only need 110, 55 in each arm to show significance. On the arm were called DMARD, uh, the drug modifying therapies, they could get any FDA approved drug. And here are the drugs they got, like natalizumab or tisabri and so forth, as well as other immune suppressive drugs not approved by the FDA, but that clinicians use all the time for bad MS, like IV cyclophosphamide, rituximab, IVIG, plasmapheresis, and all kinds of steroids. So 55 on that arm. Four actually left the control arm, and they went and got transplants somewhere else. Mm. So we've lost them. So we end up 51 on control. Importantly, if after at least one year of drug therapy, if you your neurologic disability has progressed by a certain amount confirmed by a blinded neurologist after at least six months and after at least one year of treatment, you could cross over to transplant. And I think that salvaged our treatment because patients talk to each other and they know how they're doing on each arm. Even though the evaluating neurologist is blinded, we cannot blind patients. On the other side is a transplant arm and there's 52 that went on to the transplant arm. One after enrollment, nobody treated because just had recurrent chronic infections related to, to UTI, urinary tract infections, because they have problems with urination and so forth. What are the results? Well, there were no deaths in either arm. In the transplant arm, there was no grade four toxicity. There was one positive blood culture for bacteremia with no hypotension or evidence of sepsis. There were no late opportunistic infections. Those are the type of opportunistic infections we look for, cytomegalovirus, PCP, PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is really a bad disease for patients with MS. Importantly, not shown here, if you look at just regular infections, sinusitis, otitis media, you know, ear aches, upper respiratory tract infections, pneumonia, they were more common on the drug arm than after transplant. Well, it kind of makes sense. You transplant, you're done, you're no longer on immune-modulating drugs. And uh, if we look now at the primary endpoint, progression-free survival, the solid line at the top is progression-free survival after transplant. The dashed line is con on the drugs, best available drug that the neurologist wanted to give them. And you can see there's a steady decline. Nothing happened in the first year because we could not allow failure for at least one year. You had to be on those drugs at least one year before you could be said to have failed. And um, if you look at the difference in the two arms between even just within that first year before anybody crossed over, between neurologic disability, EDSS, the lower the number, the better. And you can see on the blue line after transplant, the neurologic disability improved. Again, this was done by a blinded neurologist. Whereas in the control arm, their neurologic disability got worse despite giving best available drugs. And if we look at the lesion burden in the brain by MRI, that's a T2 weighted 
elevated T2 lesion volume in centimeters cubed in the brain, compared to baseline, you can see after transplant, the blue line, the lesion burden of disease in the brain has decreased. The brain has repaired itself. We never designed this to repair the brain, but to reintroduce tolerance. And once that happened, it appears the brain's capable of repairing itself. Whereas you can see the lesion burden, new damage in the brain continued on drug therapy. And finally, what I want to show you is this curve, disease-free survival. That's the NADA I showed you originally. That is, there's no clinical attacks, there's no neurologic progression, and there's no new or enlarging lesions on MRI and no enhancing lesions on MRI. That's known as disease-free or NADA, no evidence of disease activity. You can see on the black line, if you go out to four years, 48 months, it's 80%. On the drug, continued drug therapy, it's really zero to 5%. So our phase two non-randomized data held up even better in the control trial where we looked at the two arms. There was a marked separation of disease-free survival. In fact, better in the phase two, and I think the reason it was better is that in this randomized trial, we took only highly active disease, that is, MS that were having frequent attacks, and that's why it separated so much. The more active the disease, the more you're gonna see the difference in the, the drugs versus transplant. What I didn't bring any slides of, because I haven't put it in any medical meeting yet, and so it's reserved for the paper that will be coming out, is not only, while well, I'm showing no evidence of disease activity in a March separation of these curves, what I'm not showing, but will be in our paper, is that we actually see a marked neurologic improvement in the patient's got transplant. So that will be in our publication. Um, and again, an interesting thing here, just for you to know, it won't be in our paper, but drug therapy, all these drugs, they're roughly $70,000 a year for the drug. Every year, all drugs are about the same price, except the newer ones, like Alentuzumab. That's $156,000 for the first year, just for the drug, not physicians, not MRIs. The transplant's 125. So this could be a win-win. It helps the patient, and it's a saving to the insurance company or to the public health care system as well. And I thought this was a good quote for cellular therapy. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's, let's, take a, uh, let's take a quick look at what this might look like for a particular patient. Please watch this video. Bethany Papillardo was a happy, normal young girl. She had no signs or warning of the devastating multiple sclerosis that was to strike when she was just 18 years old, as she told ABC's Robin Roberts in this 2006 report. The most frustrating part to me was that I was, my freshman year of college, I was away from home and I had to learn how to give myself injections. By the time she was 24, walking like this was almost impossible. Worse yet, her MS attacks were coming without warning every three months or so. I woke up one morning and my legs were numb. By the end of that day, I was numb from the neck down. Bethany eventually found her way to a clinical trial at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine run by Dr. Richard Burt. It meant harvesting some of her own stem cells, then chemotherapy to reset her immune system, followed by a reinfusion of her own stored cells to rebuild her immune system. Since the procedure, she's had no, not only no more attacks, but she's had marked improvements and she's functioning normally. Within a month, Bethany was back at work as a jewelry buyer in Peoria. It's now been 13 years since the day Bethany calls her second birthday, March 8, 2005. However long this lasts, you know, until my dying day, I would never renege on anything that I've gone through. And uh, we are honored to have Bethany Papalardo with us today. Please welcome her. Thanks for joining us. Um, how are you? I'm good. Um, 13 years out and feeling perfectly fine. Per perfectly fine? No, no, no remnants whatsoever? Nothing. It's no pretty drugs, incredible. no relapses, no neurologists, nothing. You were 18 years old. Mm -hmm. um, 
how, how quickly did this, did this happen for you? How quickly did you start to feel unwell? Um, I went through the transplant when I was 25 and almost immediately. Oh, within a day or something? Um, or? You start to feel uh, put back together. Uh, you can start to feel everything. Your energy increases. Um, and you just start to go back to a normal life, which took me a while to get to. I was 10 years diagnosed before I went through the transplant. You, you, how, did you, how did you find Dr. Burt? My mom was watching Channel 10 News, or 10 o'clock news, and he, there was a news article. She wrote down the number and gave it to me. Do you, do you with, with MS, um, it's often described as having different symptoms separated by time and space, mm -hmm. meaning you could have hand weakness, and then it would go away, and then you'd get something in your left foot, for example, a year later. Do, do you worry? I mean, do you, do you worry about it coming back at this point? Every day. Every day. And it's just, it was kind of a nightmare part of my life. And I try to put it behind me, but you can't always forget it. Well, doc, Dr. Burr, what can, what can you, what, what do you tell Bethany then about that part of it? I mean, you, you have what, 13 years now, uh, but what, how confident are you that this isn't going to return? So, um, you know, we're at the leading edge of this therapy, and we don't have a roadmap. We don't have other articles to give us that answer, so we can't answer that. Um, our patients will tell us with time. I, I showed you data out to five years, which looks really good. Uh, we do have patients, several beyond 10 years, who have stayed in uh, complete remission with no new lesions and MRI or clinical symptoms who got much better neurologically and doing very well. Uh, so, I, you know, time will tell, and uh, one of the problems with this disease is there's never, nobody's ever attempted to make a definition of cure because that has never been the uh, approach or what could be achieved with drugs up to this day. Do you, um, Bethany, would, do you, do you, would you recommend this at this point with what you've gone through? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I couldn't have asked for a better chance at life. Well, Bethany, thank you for joining us. It's, it's always good to see people who, who have actually gone through this, and uh, I'm glad you're doing so well. Thank you. Bethany, thank you. Dr. Burt, thank you very much as well.